you know, I mean, there's a difference between having high social status and having high social status and using that social status to make other people miserable. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the former that I think if you, if people who don't have high social status, look at those people, then you sort of, yeah, it's like their lives are perfect. It's easy. Things are easy. And, And those kids do not necessarily have it easy at all. Um, they're just, a lot of them are just really good at hiding the struggles that they're going through, which is one of those things where, I mean, I've, you know, I just feel like I have to say this because the, inf- the re- research we're getting and the experiences I'm having as a teacher and an educator in, around the country is so powerful is that, you know, one of the things that's so infuriating about like the news clips when some young person has committed suicide is they always find somebody who says they just had a smile every day. They, I just never would have thought that this was happening, like all this stuff. And that's because young people are really good at pretend uh, showing up to school every day feeling miserable and pretending that they're fine and because we don't want to ask the hard questions adults don't want to ask the hard questions that would get the answers of why young people are feeling so so stressed and so miserable um you know we're never going to we're not really going to figure it out if we don't have the we literally do not have the strength and the courage and maturity to look at the questions and we're never going to be able to deal to be able to handle this problem I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Rosalind, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I was introduced to you by way of our mutual friend, Joseph Logan, who has been sending me a steady stream of incredible and amazing people that he happens to know. And when he told me a little bit about your work and your story, I was very intrigued. And given what it's about, I think this is a fitting question to start with. And that is, what social group were you a part of in high school? And how did that end up impacting the choices that you've made with your life and your career? (laughs) Um, Well, actually, the most powerful social group I was ever a part of was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Um, And I learned a lot about the world for better and for worse in that group. Um, So I was part of a very powerful group of girls in eighth grade. But I was the person in the group that, at least from my perspective, that could, you know, people would just relentlessly tease or would um, just feel like they could beat up on and I wouldn't really be able to do anything about it. I didn't feel like I had any power in that group at all. I just desperately wanted to stay in it. Mm -hmm. And so how did that end up influencing uh, kind of the trajectory of your life and your career? Oh, you know, not at all. Not one (laughs) bit. Um, (laughs) um, um, You know, it's funny because, you know, lots of times in life you do things and then you look back and you only understand why you do things in retrospect. But Uh at the time, you you have like no self-awareness about why you do the things that you do. Um, So, you know, really uh, when I was starting my work and I started my work at a very young age at, at, you know, the work I do now, I basically, it's all I've ever been doing. And so I started doing the work when I was about 21 and I started a nonprofit that would work on girls self-defense and sort of the path with that was that, um, in high school, um, and it's connected to those girls in high school. I dated this young man that I dated pretty much for all of high school. And for two years of it, it was, you know, sort of one of those kind of like sort of dysfunctional, but like married couple kind of like where people think it's really cute that like kids are dating. Um, and there's still kids like that today in high school. Um, but it got really um, problematic and it got really, it actually got pretty abusive by the time that I was in junior and senior year and he was really struggling with alcohol and drugs and family issues of his own and um, and he's gone on to do incredible work and to really um, reconcile you know the stuff that he did when he was younger um, but the reason that I got into that relationship with this young man was because I had such low social status within the group of girls that I was friends with in eighth grade that I really needed a boyfriend. Like I needed a boyfriend sort of for an insurance policy that they would stop being so nasty to me. And it really felt to me like, and of course, like I I couldn't articulate this at the time, but I definitely could feel what was going on. And I, I could, I could see the changes that were happening and how people were treating me once I started dating this guy. Um, because my friends felt like they couldn't treat me 
as badly, you know, so by ninth grade, they were much, much nicer to me. And one of the reasons why was because my boyfriend had a lot of social status. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that I was propelled into a relationship and why having a boyfriend was so important to me was because of the relationship and the interactions I'd had in eighth grade. So, you know, if you then move it forward of like, well, how does this influence the person I became, you know, at 21, I'm trying to get through or, um, and process having been in an abusive relationship for many years as a young, as a young person, as an adolescent and a very young woman. Um, and I needed to figure out what I did that contributed to why I stayed in this relationship. And that doesn't mean I'm to be blamed. I don't blame myself. I never blame myself for like being in this relationship, but I really needed to feel like, okay, if I, my preference would be that I don't get back into this kind of a relationship. So what do I need to look at in myself that got me there? Mm -hmm. And it was, at the, and so that was where I started looking back and saying, wait a minute, like there was those eighth grade girls that made it so important to me that I had that boyfriend. And, um, and then I took that and I just, it became part of my identity and then it became abusive and it was incredibly difficult for me, like many, many people in abusive relationships, not just women, mm -hmm. um, to leave that relationship because it was part of my identity. So all of that to say that the things that I learned in eighth grade, um, really got me to a place where I was making really bad choices about the relationships that I was in. And I guess the quickest sort of sound bitey and I, I you know, way to say it, but I mean it is that the things you learn about relationships in middle school about always about that the relationship or maintaining the friendship is more important than how the person is treating you within that relationship. Mm -hmm. That was like the real epiphany for me once I was really starting to work on this issue and really started to think about what were the quote unquote choices that people felt in relationships. And then it would get you to a place where you would, if you had developed this, you know, unfortunately, if you had developed this coping skill as a child or as a young teenager that you would bring that with you into your intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, so for me, um, my life's work and my personal has always been intertwined. And so I think that one of those experience, those experiences in eighth grade were just, you know, just really powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because for you, you know, obviously the social status was all about fitting in. Um, I'm curious, why do you think it is that we value social status so much when we're young? Because, I mean, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, the piece that I re recently wrote on Medium, and I talked about this a little bit about, you know, being uncool and how uh, exhausting it is to try to be cool. And I, I can tell you, I spent, you know, I, I've wrestled with a lot of, you know, what you were experiencing in eighth grade and never really feeling socially accepted. And I'm just curious, you know, why do you think that as adolescents, we value that so much? And what would you want parents who are listening to know about this? Well, you know, so um, one of the things parents ask me a lot is, or no, they don't ask me a lot. Sometimes people will say to me, they're answering their own question. They'll say like, well, you know, these issues, you know, people sort of randomly come up to me and say like, you know, these issues, you know, the kids are dealing with, they've been dealing with it forever. And like, and the answer of course is, yeah, sure. They sucked then and they suck now. Mm -hmm. So, and they actually have long lasting implications into why the world is so screwed up. So saying that this is just the way it is, is never an actual answer. It's just a way to not be curious about how to change things. But, um, I think that what's really important for parents and like, well, what is it, the drive? I mean, there's a couple different drives. Like we're all a combination of nature, nurture, and culture to some degree, just like we all have some degree of privilege. And some of us, you know, most of us have some degrees of privilege and some of us don't. Um, but I think what, when we talk about middle school people, literally their brains, um, and the research about this is just more and more compelling that they are literally physiologically going through a time in their life more than they ever will again, of physically, of being really focused on comparing themselves to other people and that they physically feel the pain of rejection and physically feel the elation of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And when you say that to middle school people for, or people in their mid range adolescents who are feeling this the most acutely, um, so you could be whatever age, um, one of the things that's been amazing to me is students will feel literally, you can see the physical relief. They will say like, I, I'm so glad you told me this. It makes so much sense, right? Like this feeling of rejection I'm having, like how could it be a physical feeling? And it is. And, um, and so there's that part, which is coming from their brain. But the other part is we live in a culture, our financial entire system is based on telling people and trying to sell people stuff 
and trying to convince them that they're not good enough so they will buy certain things. And so the only the best and easiest, not the best, but the most efficient way to do that is to have messages coming at you that are telling you you're lacking and you're not good enough. And if you get certain things, then you will be which therefore means that you are comparing yourself to other people. It's the basis of our entire financial and economic system. Mm -hmm. So it's, you can just, you know, we can debate the merits of that, the morality of that and the ethics of that. But I don't think anybody can disagree that the basis of our wanting to buy of this constant thing of buying things is about trying to keep up. And the way in which we are, are sold things is feeling like we don't, we're not keeping up. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and young people are on the receiving end of that, just so incredibly significantly because of all the me- the media that they're absorbing, just like all of us. But when it connects with their brain development and where they are, um, it's it's per- it's so powerful and so pervasive that it's really difficult for them to critically analyze what they're going through, which is why it is so important that they learn those kinds of things like you talked about in your article about like, what do you learn in school? Mm -hmm. You should be learning about what media literacy actually means. It should be that you need to be able to track what information is coming at you online. Um, You know, in comparison, it's, it's hard sometimes for our core curriculum classes to, you know, you look at that and you're like, what is more important for a young person to know today? Um, Those things are, they're, I mean, knowing what information is coming at you and knowing why it is making you feel insecure is one of the most important things that we need to know how to do in today's culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's funny you, you say that because I, I think that even as an adult, um, you know, being 39 year old, there are things that still make me feel insecure when I come across them in media. Um, you know, and some of it stems from, you know, early age when you know, I remember my parents not being able to afford things like a pair of Air Jordans and you'd compare yourself to the kid who got them. Right. Like, Why does that kid have them? And I don't. And my dad being able to you know, my dad's only answer is we can't afford that. And uh, right. you're going to outgrow them within a month anyways. Right, right, right. Exactly. And so, and right. And so now, right. Boys are, you know, shoe porn, like what they're what they're following on Instagram Mm -hmm. is really important, right? It's a way of them having social status. And then there's like the, so many boys wherever I travel and I swear, like not just in the United States, but wherever I travel, boys are obsessed about their shoes. And there's, you know, always boys in a school or a community that's like, you know, is entrepreneurial to a certain extent. And, you know, swapping out his shoes and selling the shoes that he gets on eBay or doing all that stuff. He's like, make, you know, he's like, he's like turning it. He's trying to turn into a little mini mogul by, you know, swapping the shoes and swapping mm-hmm. his Supreme shirts and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny you brought up boys. So that, that actually raises a question. What do you see as the differences in, you know, what, um, you know, people crave in terms of social status between girls and boys? As far as their social status goes, yeah. Like, what are they? What are they? What are they? What are the differences in what they crave as far as their social status? Uh, you know, it's funny because you know, it's uh, one of the things that I'm very uh, self conscious about. I guess is that you know, my work, um, if if from a superficial reading of it, is looks like it's very gendered, um, and I know that boys and girls run a spectrum of all different kinds of things, and rightfully, boys and girls of all ages can. Get frustrated with me um, because, you know, some do because it's it, it, the way it sometimes is like, this is what girls do and this is what boys do. And of course, there, you know, there can be really big differences that way. Having just said, and then I realized that I've just said, well, mo- wherever I go, boys are following shoes mm-hmm. on Instagram. So I do understand, I do recognize the dichotomy. Um, but, um, you know, for girls, I think, what the thing that is just everything about sort of girl culture that I wrote about many, many years ago in queen bees and wannabes is just, unfortunately, as much as we do have the spectrum of different ways in which girls can show themselves and, you know, think about images, their own images, is that everything about girl culture, the most like confined negative stereotype or only valuing girls for their body or their sexual objectification and their value that way, that everything about that has been completely ramped up and tweaked and more intense. And so, um, you know, the constant need for girls to be perfect at everything. Um, so there was always an issue for some girls about like being effortlessly perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but now is that they have to be effortlessly perfect at everything. So, um, you know, there's lots of in the United States, for example, there's, um, these, pro- there's these things, there's a program called the IB program and it's really mm-hmm. popular with a lot of people and there's a lot of merit to the program, which also does not take away from the fact that it is jacking up boys and girls, but girls, um, anxiety. It is incredibly stressful program academically. And all the adults seem to focus on in schools is how great it is because it's like so academically rigorous. And yet we have girls in unprecedented numbers, literally unprecedented numbers who are suffering from mental health issues, depression, anxiety, and thinking about hurting themselves or thinking about killing themselves. And it's really about one of the reasons why is this feeling of having to be relentlessly perfect at everything you do. So you have to have your social media super tight. You've got to have your academics super tight. You've got to have your athletics super tight. Everything has to be perfect. And so for girls, that chasing of social status and chasing of things, I think, is oftentimes tied to the ways in which they think they have to have their, you know, they just have to have it going on like all the time. Mm -hmm. For boys, um, I think that they can be... um, It's a little bit more nuanced, which is that boys in our culture still feel like they can't say that they're trying really hard um, or that they're passionately, they can be passionate about certain things with, and I talked about this in masterminds when I wrote that book about being passionate about making the world a better place. You know, like if you go to schools, the vast, vast, vast majority of kids are doing affinity groups about leadership or advocacy or like anything to do in schools with like, we're going to work together in a group to do something environmentally responsible, or we're going to support these kids because they have less resources or anything like that. Most of the time, girls are the people that are running those programs because boys culturally still feel like they can't want to show their passion for making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they can be extremely passionate about the the names that they come up with their, with their fantasy football teams. And they come up with some really, really funny names. I will grant you that. But like when we're talking about passion and about social status and like, what are they allowed culturally to do and what they're not allowed to do? um, You know, I think boys really, it's tough for both boys and for girls. And the thing that drives me bonkers and always has, but it's just like more and more makes me like when I beat my head against the wall is the adult hypocrisy of like, and the refusal to actually acknowledge what we do that contributes to their craziness and what we do that refuses to actually give them the information that they actually need to be functioning members of our society. And then when they screw up, we blame them. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, one other question I have about this, and I, w- I was thinking about this this morning as, you know, um, I was thinking about, you know, how this article that you mentioned uh, turns into a book. And for some reason, the thought crossed my mind of, you know, the prettiest girl in class in eighth grade. And I wondered what it would be like to call her and ask her, did you know that every single kid, you know, me included, had a crush on you? And what misperceptions do you think that people have about your own social status? So I- I'm curious, uh, for people who didn't have high social status in, you know, a junior high situation, mm-hmm. what do you think that they have as misperceptions about people? who did oh well i think that they you know that their lives were like mythologically perfect um that they had mythological power um that um life was easier for them um you know i mean there's a difference between having high social status and having high social status and using that social status to make other people miserable Mm -hmm. so um i think the former that I think if you, if people who don't have high social status, look at those people, then you sort of, yeah, it's like their lives are perfect. It's easy. Things are easy. And and those kids do not necessarily have it easy at all. Um, they're just, a lot of them are just really good at hiding the struggles that they're going through, which is one of those things where, I mean, you know, I just feel like I have to say this because the, the research we're getting and the experiences I'm having as a teacher and an educator in around the country is so powerful is that, you know, one of the things that's so infuriating about like the news clips when some young person has committed suicide is they always find somebody who says they just had a smile every day. They, I just never would have thought that this was happening, like all this stuff. And that's, that's because young people are really good at pretend uh, showing up to school every day, feeling miserable and pretending that they're fine. And because we don't want to ask the hard questions, adults don't want to ask the hard questions that would get the answers of why young people are feeling so, so stressed and so miserable. Um, you know, we're never going to, we're not really going to figure it out. If we don't have the, we literally do not have the strength and the courage and maturity to look at the questions and we're never going to be able to deal, to be able to handle this problem. So, 
you know, for me, if you're looking from the outside in, I think what's most important is to think about that just because something looks good doesn't mean it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the people who do abuse their power, um, you know, my experience with that is, is, you know, there are some people who, first of all, Apples don't, apples necess- sometimes do fall far from a tree. I will, you know, it's not like parents necessarily are evil and then they have evil children. Um, sometimes there are really, really nice parents who have like pa- kids who are just going through a really, really, you know, sort of hard time being decent human beings. And those parents are completely hu- embarrassed by how their kid is behaving and don't know what to do about it. Um, and it's way harder to actually fix the problem than when you're in the problem than when you're, you know, when you're quarterback, when you're advising from the side, say it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I just, if you're on the outside, I think that understandably wanting revenge, it's totally understand, absolutely understandable. Um, but I also think that we often think like, Oh, that person was insecure. And so they just took it out on other people. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. But they made other people miserable and that doesn't give them an excuse. So, you know, if you're on the outside in, I think it's it's the feeling of, yeah, they could have had a crappy life. They could have had a crappy home life, but it never gives them an excuse to treat you terribly because okay. I don't want people getting off the hook because they had a bad home life. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> a couple other questions. Uh, one is, you know, are you a parent? And uh, how, if so, how has this influenced your own parenting? Uh, two, you live in Colorado, so I, I feel like it would be irresponsible of me not to, to, to not ask you about school shootings and kind of, you know, how sure. you perspective and your work has informed that um and and you know, sure. what's our path out of that because i mean it seems so tragic yeah. that, that is the point that we've reached uh, where this has happened there's so. totally yeah yeah i mean i already was getting on my like so i could feel my soapbox getting away and then i have to I have to put myself down because no one wants to listen to somebody on my soapbox um so um you know what what was the first question again first excuse was, me are you a parent and how is this perspective influence okay. your own parenting <laughs> yes indeed i am a parent um and it's been very tricky. Um, so, you know, I, I, right now I have a 14 year old son who's literally about to turn 15, I think in a, next week. And then I have a son who just turned 17. Um, so, you know, it's a truism that people who teach on these issues are not necessarily going to know what to do with their own children. Um, <laughs> so I've and heard. it's, Oh, yeah. And it's also a truism that, you know, that just because you do this for a living, whatever that means, right, like psychology or whatever, any I'm not a psychologist, but if you work with young people, that your kids will be immune to these problems or being jerks themselves, like, absolutely not. Like my kids have been in messy situations, they've both been perpetrators, they've been bystanders, and crappy stuff that I'm embarrassed that they didn't do anything about it. Um, They've also been targets. My older child was really targeted in elementary school. Um, and I'm actually working on an article with him right now that we're doing together because he was um, he looked much older at a very young age. And he um, he always looked two or three years older. He was taller. And so kids would you would think, well, he's taller and bigger. So kids would leave him alone. But that was actually the opposite. They went after him. Um, And then the other thing that happened is that adults would either treat him with way more respect that he deserved, basically, uh, and and meaning like they would treat him with more authority and um, and or they would get really aggressive with him really fast. So, I mean, he had horrible experiences with adults um, growing up um, that were just astounding about like how fast adults can behave so immaturely when they think that they have the right to go after a kid. Um, So my kids have been, I mean, my kids have gotten in trouble. My kids have done, you know, they've, you know, they've used, for example, they've used words. I make a distinction between bad words as a parent, I don't care really if my children use the word, the drop an F-bomb once in a while. I don't care if they use, you know, like bullshit or whatever. I think my son used it at dinner last night. Like, I don't care about that. Like, really, if I'm going to pick my battles, which is what parenting is about, um, I do not care about those words unless, you know, for the most part. But I really care about them using words that are hom- that are um, homophobic, that are racist, that are sexist, and those are the words that I'm absolutely unequivocally get you know uh, forbid. Does that stop my children from using the word bitch sometimes to talk to their friends? No, it doesn't. Um, and I'm sure they've used. I mean, I'm, it, like it's been an, a real just to name one. That's been a real ongoing issue. Or 
my kids have seen terrible things at school and they've said, hell no, am I intervening? And I've had to work on, you know, my initial reaction is to get super aggressive with them, but that doesn't work. And so I guess as a way of saying it overall is that it's that parenting gives you a constant opportunity to self-reflect on like, on like your own, like, are you effective as a communicator and being able to be mindful of like how you handle yourself because, you know, Sometimes when my kids do something, I, I really get so angry that I, I can't, it's like I lose myself. My, my, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a specific story. My younger, my younger son used the word feminazi in an Instagram post to my sister. Um, my, I found out about this while I literally was teaching on this issue at a school in Canada. I'm driving home exhausted from an end of day working at school. My sister calls me who's, um, you know, she's like this awesome aunt, you know, sort of fabulous, trendy, like Brooklyn awesome aunt. And she said to me, I had put that, that my younger son had posted this comment on her, on her Instagram thing. And she took the post down. She called him. I think she screamed at him. And then she called me to tell me. And I was so angry because we've talked to my son about like what feminism means. We've talked to him about what Nazism is like we've talked to him about actually the meaning of words that those words actually don't even fit together. We've talked to them and we've talked to him about what the political connotations of that are. We covered it. And yet he still used that word. And I was so angry, so angry that I real I decided that, um, and I shot off a tax that I shouldn't have done. Like basically you have shamed me and my, our entire family. Like it was definitely like, shouldn't be like really angry, really heavy. And then I realized that what I was doing was not going to work. And so I called my husband and my husband and I very quickly decided that I was too reactive to this and that he was going to take this entirely, this conversation. So we sat down with my son and walked through again what the, why was this a big deal? What was going on with him and what our expectations were? And then late that night, I was able to calm myself down and I was out of town at the time and I talked to him. And the first thing I said to him was just talk to me about the conversation you have with your dad. And because it was coming from my husband who feels passionately about this, but doesn't have the same timber of like rage that I do about this, that he was able to listen to it much better. And I was able to take a moment and realize when am I effective and when am I not? And if it had not been my child, I would have been a thousand times more able to have that conversation. I wouldn't have had that tone of rage in my, in my, in my, you know, in how I was speaking, but I, I was with my son. And so that's the moment of like for parenting of like, when am I being effective and when am I not? And when is my emotions hijacking the situation so that I cannot uh, achieve the goal that I want and then be able to not necessarily a spouse because some people don't have spouses who can do this or don't have them at all. But to have a support mechanism of people that your your son or your daughter ha- like likes and cares enough and has a relationship with that they can get on the phone or they can reach out and say, come on and talk to me about what happened. Um, because I just know that sometimes parent you just as a parent, because you are so intensely ironically, because you are so intensely committed to this person that you are not the person to be able to handle the situation well. And I, that's for me as a parent, constantly I'm having to, rep- I am constantly given the example that I need to step back and I'm way better working with other people in general than I am like with my own kids. So it's, um, you know, and now you're asking me about Colorado, by the way, right now. Yeah. Because I just want to say that I'm in my office looking at a group of young people who are smoking pot outside of my window. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just um, so you know. Just to make it real for people. Yeah. And it's actually not common for me. It's not common for me to have this experience. But I, I literally, my office uh, faces the street. And I'm watching five people at about, I think they're like 16 or 17, mm-hmm. who are all standing around on one of the major streets of Boulder and smoking. <laughs> Which is really not even like vaping. It's like, it's totally old school. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. 
And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah, I mean, the reason I brought up Colorado is, uh, you know, I, I really would be curious to hear, you know, your perspective on school shootings, given, uh, you know, the nature of your work. Yeah. I, I'd imagine you have a lot to say about this. Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I uh, so I have a lot to say. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I think I don't know if people realize this, it's true around the country, but I'll never I only moved here five years ago. And that was I'd grown up in D.C. And um, one of the things you realize is living in Colorado and more to the point working in schools in Colorado is that um, when you walk in, you realize that any school, most, so Colorado has grown significantly, um, even since I've been here, but in the last decade. And so the schools, um, there's a lot of new schools. And what you realize is when you go out, walk into these schools is they've all been designed with school shootings in mind. So a lot of schools are built basically in the shape of an H and um, that they, that means that they can shut off a portion of the school with double sided, double locked doors at any moment. And that, you know, more than like walking into a school and having to be buzzed in and go through a double set of doors and then talking to the person, you know, to sign in and whatever, which is pretty much standard now at all schools. For some reason for me, walking in when I first moved here and realized that that's the way that the schools had been designed around the belief that school shootings would happen at the school um, was really, it just, it just, it just, it just hit me really hard. Um, and I had grown up in DC and worked in DC where a lot of the schools, like in DC proper, where the schools are old buildings, they've been redone, but they're old buildings. And so they don't have that kind of sensibility to it. So, and all the kids know why, and it's pretty common, you know, for us to, for, and I do too, you know, when I'm in schools, like drills about shooter, you know, first person responding, you know, kids have to go through this a lot. So I am, there's so many ways to respond to that, which is number one is, is that it's become normalized as part of a young person's belief you know, of like schools. And, and also I'll never forget my older son, both of my kids are athletes, like pretty high status kids themselves. And, um, they're both, I will never forget my older son saying to me, you know, um, just in passing, he said to me, well, mom, like I always make friends with the kids who are like, you know, the, you know, the kids that I think might be sort of scary because like, if they shoot up to school, I want them to like me. And, I was, and I said, like, really, that's what you're actually, you're actually making that decision. He's like, yeah, of course. Like wherever I go, I want to make friends with the kids that like, I think maybe if something goes wrong, I want them to know me and like me. And that is a normalization of violence and also of an assumption that this is a reality is something that I just think we need to really absorb. Like, what does that really feel like? Um, and then the other part that I know, and I, I mean, it's an old book, but you know, it's 10 years old, but the book um, Columbine is the, one of the best research journalism books I think that's ever been written. And I think it speaks to um, how we got this false narrative of what school shootings are about with the trench code and, you know, what was, you know, and this kind of thing that was happening that these kids were bullied and that this then started this whole bullying industry because we were all afraid that somebody was going to come in and shoot up the school. Um you know, what we know is that one of them was a psychopath and one of them was really, really clinically depressed. So, um, so here's the issues. The issues for me are that we will not give young people the resources they need for mental health issues. Um, that we allow adults in schools to abuse power way more often than we're willing to admit and or that when there is any kind of abuse of power, peer to peer or adult to peer, adult, excuse me, to young person in a school, 
that there's a lot of adults who see the abuse happening from adult to kid, but they don't know what to do about it. And then one of the dumbest and most common things that we say to kids in schools is, if you are being bullied, go tell an adult. As if that is a simple thing to do, as if that is not a risk for the child, as if this is like, this is what you should do, as if all adults are competent at being able to handle these things, as if all adults don't abuse power. And the reality is, is that young people from their coaches and from their teachers are either seeing abuse of power or experiencing it themselves or see a well-meaning adult, see another adult abuse power, and they do not know what to do. And so it, there's this whole context about school shootings that, of course, has very little to do with, of course, easy access to guns and to this kind of isolation or feeling and not giving resources to young people about mental health and not recognizing the actual dynamics that lead to the majority of kids feeling so desperate and so out of their minds that they are bringing guns to school. So, and then I know because I work in all different kinds of the country, so I get this, is that I know, and my husband owns, my husband owns guns, the person I work with owns guns, grew up my, you know, hunting, all this stuff. I get this. I'm surrounded by people like this. None of those people that I hang out with that own guns are, are saying, oh yeah, we should give free access to guns to all people at all times. Or like any kind of reasonable background check is unreasonable. The people that I know, especially, you know, in Colorado, people that I am interacting with are responsible people who believe that these things should be responsibly controlled. So it is amazing to me that we will not have honest conversations about it. And I would agree, and I think people have said this, that after Newtown happened, if we are not willing to put reasonable gun restrictions after six-year-olds have been killed, then we are not willing to do it. And it is one of the great, I believe it is one of the greatest like shames collectively and frankly individually in the country that we should be facing is that we actually allow, we actually had this experience and then we allow our politicians to say, we and our president, our 45th president to say, we need to recognize like, you know, respect to people's tragedy and their feelings right now. So we can't talk about this issue is the most disingenuous, ridiculous conversation. So if we really have the integrity and we have the honesty and we have the courage and we have just like the responsibility to community that we say we're supposed to be about, then we would have these conversations, but we don't. And so, you know, when we do this, we're isolating kids and we're creating situations where it gets that much more likely that they're going to have the access to the tools to make their desperation so much more miserable for everybody else and themselves. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, well, let's do this. It's just something I feel like slightly strongly about, I can right? see that. <laughs> well, let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about, um, you know, <clears throat> the early part of your career and how it's gotten you to now, um, specifically how you go to writing a book like Queen Bees and Wannabes, and that, of course, being turned into a movie that we'll talk about, which most people have probably heard of. Um, walk me through that trajectory. Like how that all happens. The trajectory of, of, of writing Queen Bees and Wannabes? Yeah, like from the early part of your career to getting to that point, to the point sure. of it being turned into a movie. Yeah. So, you know, I struggled um, I from 22 to like, I don't know, 28, 29. I was running a nonprofit that was doing basically what I'm doing now. And, um, and then I wanted to write a book. I'd written a book when I was 25 that like very few people write called Defending Ourselves because I was very involved in uh, martial arts at the time and self-defense. And, um, and I was teaching that a lot. So I wrote that book and then I, but I was still working on the work, the, you know, this work about like relational aggression and friendships and what was going on with girls. And I was also working with boys too in equal numbers, but it really felt to me like people did not understand what was sort of this world that seemed very obvious to me. Um, about why girls were doing the things they were doing. So I decided, you know, I had a title in my mind um, because I was writing curriculum and lesson plans. All that queen bee and wannabe stuff was coming to me anyway. And so I decided to write a book and I was 29, I think maybe 29, something like that when I was um, starting to write the book. And, um, and then I also got pregnant with my first child. And so queen bees, I wrote queen bees and wannabes um, when I was pregnant and the first three months of my older son, Elijah's life. And, um, I was already doing some media and, um, 
uh, you know, in various ways. But what happened is that a New York Times reporter followed me the year before, six months, nine months before the book was published. And then that became a cover story for the magazine. And then Tina Fey read that um, article. And that article, actually, if there was anything that, like, changed my life, um, that was it. Because sort of everybody, it became this, like, zeitgeisty thing as soon as when it hit when it was on the cover of the New York times magazine. And, um, so my whole life shifted, not just because of the movie stuff, but because like my whole life shifted pretty much overnight as soon as that article came out and it became this issue that everybody wanted to talk about. And, um, what was hard for me was that I was, I wrote about queen bees and wannabes cause I didn't want people to say like, Oh, she's this and she's that and that kind of stuff. It was actually the opposite. What I wanted to do was create a language so people could figure out the behavior they were seeing so that we could get people to a better place. But people love, um, you know, for better and for worse, people love um, pigeonholing and labeling things and labeling can be powerful because it can, it can describe behavior, but also can be really limiting because it can really put somebody in a box. And, and I'm actually completely against putting people in boxes, What I am very much for is trying to understand behavior and putting some names to it so that we understand the behavior. So, um, so I book comes out and I'm just sort of overwhelmed by being a new mom and, handling the amount of attention that was going on and then um started getting a uh, request to buy the rights to it for a movie and I said no like mm, several times to- many to- I don't know four times something like that and then um Tina Fey had a um I, she, I believe I mean I'm, I know this she had a um, like she needed to write a screenplay and she didn't know what to do it about. And so she read the article and she was like, well, this seems like something I could do. And so she, you know, it was, and nobody was super famous then. nobody, you know, mean girls didn't have, wasn't, you know, wasn't, it was pre mean girls, if you can believe that. And, um, and she just like, I got to, I have to write this screenplay and I think maybe I should do it with you. And so, you know, I talked to her a couple of times and I was like, well, you know, this seems like a smart woman, somebody that, you know, she's my age, like we get along. She has my sense of sarcasm and whatever. So the sort of my sensibility about feminism and about sort of self accountability, rights, responsibility, just my sort of sensibility. And, um, and what I mean by feminism is because remember I have two boys that have dealt with lots of girls. They have dealt with girls saying feminism means girls are better than boys which of course is a crack is totally ridiculous and a stupid definition and wrong definition of feminism. Feminism is about having a critical lens to look at different kinds of privilege in the world, including gender. And so it's, um, so just, you know, sort of similar sensibilities. Um, and, um, and, you know, I gave her the rights to do it and we were sort of off to the races. Like 18 months later, Mean Girls came out literally 18 months after I had probably my first conversation with her. Mean Girls was in theaters. Uh-huh. Um, lots Which of questions. Has never happened. It, well, no, lots never of questions, ever. as you might imagine. Um, <clears throat> one, you know, what uh, what did you learn from working with somebody that is really kind of at this point a master of their craft? You know, I mean, Tina Fey is, is pretty much a household name, and you know, as far as comedy goes, she's iconic at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious that what you so, learned from her. So cool. I'm going to tell her that she's that she's now iconic. That we're <laughs> so old. That you now put these words to it. That's so funny. Oh, we're so old. Um, so because we were in our, you know, I was what 31. So she's, you know, she was 30. Whatever. I was. She's two years younger than I'm. So 31, 30, 29. Whatever it is. Um, so let's see. Um, how was it like? What was it like? I mean, I tend to want to work with people that are smart and, um, don't take themselves too seriously. And, you know, I, I try and align myself with men and women who have those characteristics. Um, and I've never really thought about, you know, I mean, I work with teenagers all the time. So my bullshit, you know, my, I have zero tolerance for like people being like, Hey, you know, I'd like to do this with you. I'm like, no, absolutely not. So I just, um, I don't know. It just it felt like a natural decision to me of like, if I was going to do this and this seems like the right person to do it with. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm doing that today. I actually tell you the truth. Same reason, although we haven't come out with anything yet. Cause there's been various dramas around it, but, um, I've, you know, I have dear friends, Sean Anders and John Morris, who wrote, um, who are one of the writers on, we are the Millers and did daddy's home. And, um, 
um, a, a Sex Drive, I think was their first movie. And it, sim- it was a similar thing where I sat in a room at this time. It was like I sat in a room with them and they're funny and um, smart. And um, if they hear this, they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe she said that we're smart. Um, but, you know, I just there was a similar sensibility of just like these are smart, hardworking, funny people that I want to work with. So I'm going to I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I'm just going to throw my lot in with them. Mm-hmm. How was your um, a couple of things? I, I'm curious, you know, as you've gotten older, uh, and this is something I've been asking a lot of people. I think mainly just because of, of the fact that I'm getting older, and it's been on my mind. You know, you've been commercially successful uh, in you know a creative career, and a lot of people, you know, often aren't fortunate enough to have that experience. I'm curious if your definition of success has changed over the course of your life. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah, that's well, gosh, that's like more and more hours of talking. Um, So, I mean, one of the things that is a curse, it's a blessing and a curse for me is that I never feel like I've reached a level of success. Um, You know, I'm always I always feel like I have to I never feel like I can let my guard down about doing things mediocre. If I feel that I've done things in a mediocre way, I have a really, really hard time with it. you know, I, so my definition of success when I was younger was definitely very similar to what we talked about in the beginning about comparing myself to other people. Um, and that was really hard for me. Now, was it a driver for me to get things done? Sure it did. Um, but as I've gotten older, my definition of success is that I feel like the integrity of the process, there's more focus on the integrity of the process and um, feeling like I truly did the best I could in the process of self-reflection and putting together something that is really reflective of like where I am right now. Um, and the comparison stuff, I mean, I still have the comparison stuff. Like I, I haven't put out a book and I had a curriculum come out last year, end of 2016. I have a book that I really, really want to write. I'm hugely working um, in schools to do systemic change for school so that this issue of young people being able to trust adults around abuse of power, that we do something about that. So I'm, I'm pouring all of my energy into this program called Owning Up that we're doing in schools around the country and some internationally and I'm, I'm really busting my butt and yet I still feel like oh I haven't done this article for this I haven't done that I haven't done this I haven't written the book oh my gosh if I don't write this book then I'm not gonna be able to compete with my peers like all of this stuff still runs in my head um, but I guess I mean I, I don't guess I feel like I try harder to process the impact of that on the quality of my life and how I would define success So, and to forgive myself a little bit that I can't write a book, keep up with writing articles, travel around the country, doing all these conferences and speaking to kids and be home for basketball practice Hmm. (laughs) where, you know, I bust my butt to get home so I can take my kid to basketball practice. And, you know, I get like every other parent gets, I get like, Oh, Hey mom, what's up? Yeah. Um, you know, I want to finish with two questions, you know, and I think it kind of brings us full circle because, you know, we alluded to the article that I wrote. Um, why aren't we teaching? Why isn't this more common in our schools? And why don't we teach this stuff in our schools? The things that I was talking about in the article. Oh, because so what the funny, funny meaning, incredibly frustrating, curl your hair out stupidity that schools cling to is that individually, if you ask the vast majority of administrators and teachers, um, what young people need, they will say that, um, young people go to school and stay in school and want to be in school and do well because of the relationships that they form in schools with a well-meaning, passionate adult who cares for them. Um, they will say that it is not about, um, standardized tests and it's not about teaching to the test. And they will, they will talk about that. And they know that that is the reason that they know it. And yet when we get into a group, when educators get into a group, we default to this kind of thinking. And it's also very, it's also way too common in schools that we get away with, um, saying things like, well, I just have to teach the test or, you know, I just get all these things that, you know, for teachers to say that, which some of them are not, there's two things that are true. One is, is that teachers have a ridiculous course load and they're constantly being evaluated. And one of the things that we talk about now a lot in schools is about growth mindset. That's what they, people love growth mindset now for very good reason. And if you don't know it, it's basically like, I'm not good in math. You don't say I'm not good in math. You say I'm not good in math yet. 
And that's the way that we're trying to talk to young people about their skills and their capacities. And yet we never, ever, ever talk to teachers in that way. Teachers are constantly being evaluated and or if they're not or once in a while they're being evaluated, but they're being evaluated arbitrarily and there's no growth mindset for the educators who are actually teaching it. So teachers feel like they're basically about to fail all the time or they're going to fail. They're being given a test that they can't that they're not given the resources to, to do well on that test. They're getting set up for failure. Like, oh, hi, here's 28 kids and 14 of them have individual learning plans because they have learning differences. And we've got these kids over here who, I mean, it's just on and on. And we're not going to have meaningful or common sense cell phone rules. So the kids are going to be, you, you know, looking at porn under their desks all day. And you're not going to be able to handle it well because we're not going to give you rules that enforce that well because we don't want to admit that kids are looking at porn on their phones. So it's. It, like all, and in fact, what we'll do instead is we're going to give them a one-to-one -one Chrome tablet because we believe that kids need to, every child needs to have a technology in their hand because that's like without actually giving them the rules to be able to <laughs> to be able to behave on those Chrome tablets. Well, the thing that we will do is we will have a cyberbullying assembly that we're going to tell all the kids things that they already know. And with really unrealistic ways, and then they're going to go back into their classes and use their cell phones and look at porn. So it's the, the way in which teachers have to deal with <laughs> what the situations are is literally laughable. Um, at the same time, it's really hard to be able to hold in some ways teachers accountable for bad behavior. And so when you ask the question of why are we not doing things that are common sense, it's because we're too afraid to have the questions and to be to change in a way that make this respectful to teachers experiences and responsibilities and it is respectful to young people's experiences as well and that's i believe why like from a meta like kind of larger context like why we don't do that so one of the things for example that i've been saying to teachers around the country is so if Instagram's a really big deal for your kids and they're really focused on their followers to following ratio, um, when you're in middle school and you need to teach ratios, why don't you teach it through that of like up your Instagram accounts, look at people's Instagram accounts and we're going to teach you about followers to following ratio with, we're going to teach you ratios based on that. Or we're going to teach you about all different kinds of things that are related to, we can do core curriculum classwork and do it in a way that makes sense. And the thing just to back up your article is that when I ask young people, what do you want to learn about? The thing, you know, like in their like sort of life skills classes or whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call it. The thing that they want to hear about is they don't want to hear about bullying and cyberbullying because it's so stupid the way that people talk about it. And the sec but what they want to talk about is healthy relationships, how to tell a, fr a friend that's actually like a good friend of yours. Like how do you tell if somebody is a good friend? How do you change a tire? And how do you, and what is it about credit cards? Like, how does it work? How do credit cards work? How do you apply for credit cards? Yeah. Do you have to pay for it? How do you pay for it? That's four things, the most common things that kids are telling me they want to know. <laughs> wow. Um, so I Which want to finish. Which one shows how smart they are. Because if, if, if the majority, if, the, if people in this country knew the answer to those four questions, uh -huh. you would be in pretty good shape. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Wow. Uh, well, I want to finish with one last question, uh, which is how we finish all of our interviews with the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I was thinking about this, but this is a very tough question. Um, <laughs> I, unmistakable means that you, to me, is some, there's, it's a two, two part for me. One is that you're able to laugh at yourself, but that you are, you're able to laugh at the things you're, you're uh, see, I'm losing. I was thinking about it and I overthought the question. It's that you are able to laugh at yourself and also take big things seriously. So, um, you know, we, this is another hour conversation, but this whole thing about being politically correct is a really interesting conversation and one that I have with young people all the time because we need to have really important dialogues with people in uncomfortable ways. Um, and safe doesn't mean you don't have uncomfortable conversations. But so for me, it's being able to be self-reflective, laugh at yourself and laugh at how absurd things can be, but also take the things that are like people's dignity and the things that are big things, take them seriously and be able to stand up for those things. For me, that makes somebody unmistakable. Mm. Wow. Well, I think that makes a, a really fitting end to our conversation. Um, 
I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and insights with the listeners. This has been phenomenal. Um, where can people oh, learn more about your work? Um, so it's culturesofdignity.com. Uh -huh. And if you want to look at the um, curriculum, actually, that I referenced, it's also that also can be found on owning up. Um, dot online, but the major, our website is cultures of dignity.com. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the unmistakable creative podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.